there are great ideas undiscovered. Breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of, one of truth's, truth's protective, protective layers. layers. If you've got this gut-wrenching feeling that something big is about to happen, there's a reason. And it has everything to do with what is now being disclosed to the general public. Bombshell UFO report is expected in June from the U.S. government. Meantime, UFO sightings in New York have nearly doubled since the pandemic began, and we are getting new video from the Navy showing pyramid-shaped objects flying in the sky. We were warned by the late Werner von Braun in the years leading up to his death in 1977 that there were going to be a certain number of cards played on humanity, all leading to a culminating event. Now, everything Werner von Braun warned us about has come true, except for what he called the final card that they were going to play on us, and it has everything to do with UFOs. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians are going to be considered to be the enemy. In fact, when I met him in 74, they were the enemy. Then terrorists would be identified, and that was soon to follow. We heard a lot about terrorism. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. We now call them nations of concern. But he said that would be the third enemy against whom we would be needing to build space-based weapons. And the next enemy was asteroids. This new one you're tracking. How big? It's what we call a global killer. Nothing would survive, not even bacteria. An asteroid some scientists call a city killer came closer to Earth than the moon this week. The scary thing is that scientists had no idea it was coming. Now at this point, he kind of chuckled the first time he said it. Asteroids against asteroids were going to build space-based weapons. So it was funny then. And the funniest one of all was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final card. And over and over and over during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Carol, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens. And all of it, he said, is a lie. The way he said it to me, there was no doubt, no doubt in my mind that he knew something that he was too afraid to talk about. Can you tell us, have unidentified flying objects been seen? Well, sure. We, we have uh, lots of reports about what we call uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon. Just a few days ago, the Pentagon confirmed that a 2019 video of a UFO sighting is actually real. It was a UFO. Very importantly, I'm hereby directing the Department of Defense and Pentagon to immediately begin the process necessary to establish a Space Force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. That's a big statement. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. They've done a great job systematically programming each one of us into believing that this alien threat is very real and very near. But what they don't want us to realize is what ancient accounts actually say about these beings. Now the idea that ancient aliens encountered mankind is very popular today. We've all seen these accounts of aliens bringing us great technologies and sharing all these secrets with us. But what they want you to forget is the actual origin of these ancient alien stories. They were never considered to be from outer space. They were considered to be fallen angels. Could we reinterpret the story of fallen angels as beings not from heaven, but from Mars? Accounts dating back thousands of years depict an angelic race of people coming down and sharing their technology and their ideas with mankind, even producing offspring. But they want us to forget that and replace it with this idea of ancient aliens from space. And they have to, because that's the only way this deception is gonna work, is if we don't understand what's going on. Now, if we look back at the origin of the modern alien abduction era, we'll see that it has a very 
demonic undertone. And look at this character right here, Alistair Crowley. He's out there in January through March of 1918 doing a series of magical experiments called the Amelantra Workings in which he is said to have opened a portal to another dimension allowing an entity, I believe a demon, named Lamb to enter through it. Now this is the drawing that he made in 1918 of this character that he apparently had some interaction with. You know, if you look at this picture, it's curiously similar to something we might call an alien gray today in pop culture. So, you know, if you, it doesn't take a whole lot of research on this character to realize he was into some really, really dark stuff. So why did I bring this up? This is, you know, 1918 time frame. Well, you have this character who is very much a part of the early space program, Jack Parsons, who is basically a, a disciple, practically an heir apparent to Crowley and all of his activities. Well, supposedly Crowley's portal was further enlarged by Jet Propulsion Laboratory founder and rocket fuel scientist Jack Parsons. Okay, this is the guy who's one of the founding members of JPL. It was a big part of NASA and the space program. And he's out there with Scientology and Dianetics founder L. Ron Hubbard in March of 1946 at a location that later became known as Area 51. They're doing all kinds of ceremonial sex magic. And they called it the Babylon working, and it's very similar to the Amalantra working, based on ceremonial sex magic. But unlike Crowley, however, they were not as adept at opening and closing portals, and theirs apparently stayed open. And the modern UFO era began one year later in 1947, the same year Crowley died. So, you know, this is all going on about the same time you've got Admiral Byrd going down there for Operation High Jump, you know. And a decade later, we got the founding of NASA, and these are the characters, okay? Freemasons, Nazis, and occultists creating the space program. What we're thinking of as, as aliens are, they're, uh, they're, they're extra-dimensional beings that an earlier precursor of the, um, the space program made contact with. Uh, they, they are not what they claim to be. Uh, they have infiltrated a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of aspects of, of, of the military establishment, particularly the Area 51. I, I remember the conversation very well. Um, this is a person I respected tremendously, very, very senior person. He told me, he said, Lou, I want you to stop, stop doing this. I said, okay, sir, I, I, I certainly can, but may I ask why? And he says, well, we already know what it is. Now, at that moment, I, I honestly thought maybe it was our own technology. I was running up against some super uber secret sap, and, uh, you know, they were telling me to stop. And I said, okay, sir, so, so it's ours? And he said, no, that's not what I'm saying. And he said, uh, he asked me point blank, have you read your Bible lately? And I wasn't quite sure where he was going with that. And I said, well, sir, I, 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 I think I know what it says. What, where are you going with this? And he said, well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic and we should not be pursuing them. Yeah. And uh, I, I, he, was, he wasn't kidding me, but that's exactly how, how he felt. So this is a Pentagon. And, this is a DO, Department of Defense official. Uh, saying, stop looking at UFOs because they're demonic? Correct. Before we can actually fully appreciate just how big this deception is going to be, we have to uncover the underlying deception, the one that puts this whole thing to rest. We all grew up believing the story that we were told, that Earth is just a speck of dust in an infinite universe, that there are other Earth-like galaxies out there and planets far, far away, and aliens could come visit us one day. But think back to the origin of that reality. It was told to us by people that we know and trust, our teachers, our parents, everything we saw on television supported this narrative. But what if we were actually at the center of the universe in a very unique place? And that brings us back to what every ancient cosmology understood about the skies that they were seeing above they were not told what to believe. They were going out and they were mapping out the skies. And every one of them came to the conclusion that these stars that were rotating above our heads were making their own orbits in a fixed way. They believed that the heavens above were unchanging. 
Now they also believed the earth wasn't spinning or moving. They believed it to be perfectly still. And if we go back to the Genesis accounts, we start to see that they had this idea that there was a vast solid covering known as the firmament. It was the second day of creation. That's when it was made. The entire second day was spent making this solid covering. And that's where the stars were said to be placed. And other ancient cosmologies outside the Bible had the same understanding that the stars were fixed and they would all continue to make the same predictable paths for thousands and thousands of years. Many of their ancient structures were built specifically to line up with constellations. And thousands of years later, here we are seeing these same structures line up with the constellations they lined up with when they were built. They were using the sky as this great timepiece above to keep track of the days, the weeks, the months, the years. And that's how they understood things to work. That the earth was relatively flat, stationary, with a fixed solid covering. Okay, now we were all taught in school that Christopher Columbus sailed in this big circle and that proved once and for all that we live on a globe. But ancient maps, even after Columbus sailed his big circle, still showed that the earth was flat and stationary with Antarctica being the edge. And what we all considered as settled science that hundreds of years we've just known that the earth was a ball in infinite space, it was a highly debated issue until very recent history. And they were actually teaching the earth was flat in schools as recently as the 1920s. We were just talking and I asked you what, what shape the earth is and what did you say? What were you taught in school when I in elementary school? I was taught in school that the earth was flat. And the first person to ever venture far enough up to see what the earth looked like was a guy named Auguste Picard. Most of us have never heard of this person because when he made it to the stratosphere, he said he saw what appeared to be a flat disc with an upturned edge. Now after Auguste Picard ventured to the stratosphere, we have the US Air Force showing us the stars from space for the very first time. And when you look at what they showed us, what they actually saw, you begin to understand why the moon landing never had stars in the background, why they're not showing us stars from space anymore, because it's very difficult to pull this off. The sky is uh, a deep black. So as you can see the stars. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. The sky, of course, was, uh, was black. The heavens are 10 times as bright, stars 10 times as numerous. And we could not see stars. The thing about Carl Sagan, billions of billions, of stars, there really are billions and billions of stars, and you can see them. It's, it's a, a, an unfathomable blackness, like a, with a, a, a tux, texture you feel like you could stick your hand into. And that's when things start to get weird, because people have gone back and looked at declassified documents that for some reason keep mentioning a flat, non-rotating Earth. Over and over again, it's in their flight plans, it's in all their working models, this flat, stationary Earth repetitively keeps showing up. If it doesn't exist, there'd be absolutely no reason to base all of your science on it. Something else shows up. In the 50s, in Russia, they had documents describing the firmament. It's a long fly ball going back, back. And the ball shatters the sky, bringing the ocean itself down into the stadium. Oh, Simpson just broke this dream's reality wide open. And we take for granted our entire view of the universe hinges upon the Apollo moon missions. It was actually the first time we ever saw our planet as a whole. And somebody confirmed to us what we're being taught is actually real. We found uh, a very unique reel of footage. And, and you want me to see this while you have me on camera? Well, and to, and to tell us what it is. <laughs> An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11. Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong staging part of their mission for nearly an hour. I think when you see the footage, You'll, you'll see that it's what? very extraordinary, one of a kind, okay. behind the scenes yeah. type of footage. Yeah. Well, if it is, why do you have access to something that no one else has seen before? Serendipity, I guess. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. 
What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground. Turn the camera off, please. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. If you show this publicly, you're open for a lawsuit. Here is the diffused work light that they used to see camera controls, but not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Finally, the iris is opened up, and you can see the real location of the camera, and the very bright and near Earth out the window. You're talking to the wrong guy. Why don't you talk to the administrator at NASA? We're passengers. We're, we're guys going on a flight. Now maybe we could say they faked the moon landings, but what about every single space agency after this? We're putting our trust in people to be honest and show us exactly what they're seeing. They would have no reason to lie about going to space, being on a space station, but that's where things start to get even weirder because we're catching them making big mistakes. They're having CGI glitches, their wire harnesses are not uh, working correctly. If you do enough searching, you will find clip after clip of NASA fails. These people messing up in the middle of what's supposed to be a live feed because we, even with the best technology, things screw up. So uh, many times during um, spacewalks outside the International Space Station, we can see air bubbles rising up. Can you touch on how there are air bubbles in space? Um, air, can you be more specific, air bubbles? So yeah, like a lot of times during the footage, the NASA footage, you can see bubbles coming up out of the helmets or kind of from underneath you. Um, how do you explain bubbles in space? Yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. You might, there's, now, sometimes you get water in the helmet and it comes, it's either, it's either uh, you know, from sweat or from the cooling garments. And, um, you know, in some of my spacewalks, I had like water in the helmet, not like I was gonna drown in the helmet, but just little bits of water probably came from uh, sweat. Often um, on the outside of the space station, you'll liberate little pieces of, um, you know, there, it's a really harsh environment out there and the outside of the space station gets beat up pretty good. And sometimes, you know, you'll see just little flecks of paint or something that you might have disrupted floating away from the suit. And, uh, you know, that's generally what that is. I've never seen any kind of air bubble anywhere. Yeah. Could, it, could it be that you're filming in an underwater pool and you're not really out there? <laughs> Now, you and I could put this whole thing to rest ourselves by going to space. Civilians could go to space. They've been promising us this for years. We can just take a rocket and go to space, right? They are working on it as we speak. In a year's time, in the last few months. Early next year. Very few months. Sometime next year. By the end of the year, we should be taking members of the public into space. By the mid-2030s. By 2020. Early in the next decade. Before 2023. And by 2025, most certainly in our lifetime. That's 2024. We should have a permanently occupied human base on the moon and send people to Mars. It's going to grow old if we don't start flying next year. We'll return Americans to the moon for the first time since 1972, if you can believe that. With our hopes of ever going to space continually burning to the ground, we're left with no other option but to take the pictures of Earth that NASA gives us. Uh, I don't want a full year. Last month, for the first time since 1972, NASA released the Blue Marble. 
a single snapshot of the Earth taken from outer space. NASA's Rob Simon made this, and it had wide appeal too. For example, it ended up as the default background on the iPhone. I didn't even know until I bought an iPhone um, and turned it on and kind of did a little happy dance. Simmons' job is... It's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is, a composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. A single snapshot of the Earth taken from outer space. The, to us, the really cool thing was the data set. Up until that point, there was no realistic color map of the globe anywhere. There's artistry to creating the world. It, what I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. But I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, it has to be. The only time we ever see curvature from any high altitude balloons or anything that was sent up, it's created using a fisheye wide angle lens effect. We saw this during the Red Bull jump. Anytime they send up something on television, you're gonna see this curved horizon, but it's the result of this wide angle lens. If you send up a non-fisheye lens, to the highest height, no matter how high you go, horizon always rises to your eye level and it's always perfectly flat. We could also go to satellite footage. After all, aren't there thousands of satellites orbiting the Earth right now? One would think. And yes, there are in fact satellites being sent up year after year, there have been for decades. The only problem is these satellites are launched on balloons and they have been falling down all over the world. For a Michigan couple, when a satellite crash landed in their backyard and their reaction, priceless. You never know what's gonna happen. This baby fell out of the sky and landed in our yard. Oh, we've had a problem here. Forget it, Bard. It's so bright out, you can't see anything in the sky except the Fox satellite. Now this brings us to our second method of proof. If we can't go to space, we could simply sail anywhere towards Antarctica, towards the Southern Hemisphere, and eventually we're going to hit the edge of the known universe, the firmament, or whatever, whatever's out there. Could there be more land? We don't know. But we could go prove for ourselves by circumnavigating north to south. The only problem is no one's allowed to do this. The Antarctic Treaty prevents it. You can take a guided tour, they'll take you to a fake South Pole and tell you, okay, this is where it is, but independent exploration is prohibited. It's guarded heavily by the military. You can't just go to Antarctica and check it out for yourself. Antarctica has effectively been off limits since December of 1959, and this was signed into law and agreed upon by over 50 countries. That should raise a little bit of concern. Why would a icy continent be off limits? Well, that's something we may never find out. Admiral Richard Byrd, one of the first people to really explore Antarctica, came back making bizarre claims of resources and in a time when Antarctica would be highly sought after by other nations. He also talked about unexplored land beyond the South Pole. Admiral Bird, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this Earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. This is a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, do you hope to see that? I do. Okay, so we can't personally go high enough to see this planet or sail far enough away to see if there is an end to this Earth or some land beyond Antarctica, but we do have a chance to watch rockets 
launch. They go up all the time. You can watch these rocket launches that seem to be happening more and more, but you have to wonder why they're taking this curved path and they're not going straight up. Now the official answer is they're taking some curve with gravity and there always will be some cover story for why they can't go straight up. But the big question is why are we now stuck in low earth orbit? We seem to get past it multiple times during the Apollo missions. The moon is well beyond low earth orbit, but now we're stuck and NASA will tell you for themselves. Right now, we only can fly in earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. As we get further away from earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Any ill effects from the Van Allen radiation belts? No, now I'm not sure we went far enough out to, to encounter the Van Allen radiation belt. Maybe we did. The belts are 1,000 miles to 25,000 miles above the, the Earth. We, then we went right out through them. No effects on your cells? Mm -mm, didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology, and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. This next generation spacecraft will enable America to explore beyond low Earth orbit. Well, one thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the Earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the Earth. <laughs> So what about the proofs we were actually given for this Earth being a globe other than pictures and NASA? One of those, the first that I recall, is boats going over the curvature. As ships sail away, they don't disappear all at once. Now first, the bottom will disappear. See, the bottom of the ship is gone. Now we can see midway up and then the whole thing disappears. Now ships came back, they didn't fall off a table. So people realized that the world is curved. I mean, it's a big curve, but it's curved. So, the process of testing claims, the world is flat, the world is round, is what we call science. Now, if you have a claim that can't be tested, that's what we call pseudoscience. The difference between pseudoscience and regular science is whether or not you can test it. The flat earth, well, that didn't stand up to tests. The round earth did. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. The world is round. Now this seems legit. Boats do appear to disappear bottom up and go over a curvature at a pretty relatively short distance, which would make sense if the Earth is indeed a ball. The only problem with this theory is when you take a high zoom camera, a telescope, or something with high zoom capabilities, you can bring back a boat that has appeared to vanish. All right, we have optical limits to how far we can see certain objects. Not to mention atmospheric lensing. Your atmosphere will act like a lens. And you can test and repeat this on a very flat surface with a camera yourself. You will see objects appear optically to disappear bottom up, just like they're going over a curvature, but you can demonstrate this on a flat surface. It's testable and it's repeatable. Science. Another big proof we were given was our sun, which it does appear to be going over the curve of the earth. And we're told that's because we're falling backwards because of our rotation as we orbit the sun. But once you realize the sun is a local light, it's the exact same size as our moon above. That's why they line up perfectly on an eclipse. It's not because of the coincidence that one's just 400 times larger, but also 400 times farther away. It's a much closer light and it's much smaller. Now you would think because of all the false models we're given of this flat earth theory that it would just always be daylight or you should always be able to see the sun, but it's much closer and much smaller so when it moves away from your line of sight it follows the known laws of perspective and it has to follow these laws because as objects that are even if they're high up as they get further away they appear lower and lower and eventually you're going to see it vanish due to perspective and the fact that our atmosphere isn't transparent it might be clear for certain distances but eventually everything's going to fade out you can find time-lapse footage of the sun doing just this. It will 
you can see it you can see it and then all of a sudden it fades out and appears to vanish that's because it is traveling through an atmosphere that is not transparent 100 percent and it is taking its local light with it Perhaps the greatest trick of all was convincing us that we are simply another planet. We all learned the planets in school, we had songs, we built solar system models, and when we looked up and saw these lights in the sky, we assumed that we were simply a light in someone else's sky. It was a really good trick because that is the one that most people go to. How are we not round if other planets are round and we are assuming these lights to be other planets? But when they send us these images of other planets, you have to read the fine print and wonder why they rely so heavily on CGI. Over the years, NASA has given us spectacular photos and renderings that reveal a colorful and mysterious universe. In a small bright office, working side by side. Let's see. Huh? Robert Hurt and Tim Pyle bring the universe to life. What we're doing does have real science underlying it. Tim, once a Hollywood animator, is now a planet illustrator. Together, they produce some of NASA's most popular images. And this is sort of how it comes to me. And then I Many of those guys. images have a dark, grainy start, but color and light reveal an astonishing glimpse of how the deepest regions of space might appear to the human eye. It's a delicate blend of imagination and data. The artists meet with NASA scientists over many drafts to ensure a planet or galaxy look lines up with the research to make each one as accurate as possible. I love the challenge, it's kind of like a puzzle to me, of trying to create something that looks really cool within the restrictions that were given by the scientists. It can take days, even weeks, to produce just a single image. The dazzling final results, enough to keep us all dreaming of the final frontier for years to come. And while NASA struggles to get consistent photos or videos of our planet, they have no problem sending us HD images from Mars. We're expected to just believe these are legitimate. Now there is one final thing we can do. Given the known circumference of Earth, we could simply measure these things for ourselves. And people have been doing this. They have been going out over large bodies of water and large areas of land and measuring to check for curvature. And what we have found simply is that we see too far. We see far, far beyond what the globe math should allow us to see. The current record holder for the longest line of sight photograph captured mountain ranges we're 275 miles away. They should have been at the given height and distance nearly 4,000 feet below the line of sight. This is from Joshua Nowicki, and what you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage. As we find ourselves on an earth much different than we ever imagined, it brings us back to this upcoming deception, this final card, and what it's truly all about. We are dealing with a huge, probably the most important deception on humanity. What I'm telling you is there's a cover up about disinformation, and has been, by the top researchers that you people rely on to hear the truth from. Over the next 10 years, I have now worked with over 400 cases of people that have been able to stop the abduction experience in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. These are entities masquerading as high technological aliens, but they can be defeated by one name. And I saw Three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. A new world order. A world for the rule of law. 
that the law of the jungle governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order. A new world order. A new world order. A new world order. There's no way for us to know exactly where this alien deception is heading, but one thing is for sure, we are witnessing the fulfillment of prophecies in scripture that told us we were going to eventually head to a one world government. A great deception is coming. We can count on it. And we have to return to the power of the one who put us here, the one who is going to have the final say. I'm amazed. I'm so happy to know it's true. It's true, and God created yes, this world. Yes, yes. And, and he's right here in the clouds above, close, not in an infinite universe. So good, right? And I can't get over it. Made me cry. <laughs> Made me cry, too. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, Ruth, give me a hug. Here we go. <laughs> I need it. Pan tam był. Czy Ziemia rzeczywiście jest kulą zawieszoną w kosmosie? Jest płaska. Tak jak oczekują oni. Nie spodziewałem się co prawda tego pytania, ale zapewniam Pan, że jest płaska. To jest najlepszy flight of the proof, right behind me. This is what you have to believe in, if you believe in the ball. You have to believe that you're spinning faster than the speed of sound. That you're orbiting 66,000 miles an hour, which you can't even fathom that speed. While you're chasing the sun at a half a million miles an hour, while the whole system is moving sideways at 1.2 <laughs> miles an hour. Right? And, and all of this is happening, okay? And, uh, and how it started to happen is ridiculous, but while all of that is happening, this happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay? <laughs> oh, dude, you got some great images. I love it. <laughs> you can't I mean, prepare. Images, this is the Earth. This is the you know, water at re large bodies of water at rest lay flat. So then all of a sudden the United States and Russia engaged in these high altitude nuclear tests and the United States calls theirs Operation Dominic within which we have Operation Fishball. Look up the name Dominic from the late Latin name Dominicus, meaning of the Lord. Fishball was part of Operation Dominic. It looks like they are sending high altitude nuclear bombs to test the fishball of the Lord, i.e. the firmament. You can tell it's real because it looks so fake, honestly. <laughs> I was talking with a gentleman from Belcom and, and we were discussing uh, the lie. Everything he was telling me was different from what we were being told uh, was the truth. And at one point I asked him, I said, man, you guys, you lied about a lot, didn't you? And instantly he said, no, we didn't lie about certain things. We lied about everything. None of it was true. And also when we, against the orders of President Truman, when Alan Dulles brought in all the Nazi scientists and so forth, they went to two places. They went to CIA and they went to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration which in our world we call it not a space agency. <laughs> and as Kathy O'Brien has said so clearly, that's where the bulk of the mind control has been done. The space suit has replaced the cowboy outfit of an earlier year. And the dream of a rocket trip to some distant planet has outdated the old fashioned desire to fly a plane around the world. Um, so, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. Yeah. It gets wider in the middle and so Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere, it's an it's oblate, and officially it's an oblate spheroid, that's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way, it's like pear-shaped. Check this out. This is uh, from Taiwan to Los Angeles, and the Hawaii's out there kind of in the middle. Right about here, there was a medical emergency. Where would you land if you were the pilot? Hawaii. Right, or maybe go to Los Angeles. 
Instead, they went all the way up to Alaska. What? Why did they go to Alaska? The answer is because this is the route. Taiwan. Oh, shit. Sure. Emergency. Alaska. Hawaii is all the way out here. This is the actual route that they take. He has called them the Galactic Federation of Aliens. And he says President Trump is aware of the existence of these aliens and had been on the verge of revealing their secrets, he claims, but was asked not to do so by the Federation in order to prevent what he calls mass hysteria. Well, the retired general says the US and Israel have kept it from the public because quotes, humanity isn't ready and the aliens don't want to reveal themselves until humanity can evolve, he says, and understand what space really is. Because space is the world's newest warfighting domain. Space is a warfighting domain. The next warfighting domain. Space is a warfighting domain. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven.